Welcome to Health Beat Brooklyn on Brooklyn Independent Television. I'm Dr. Monica Sweeney. Hurricane Sandy slammed into our shoreline communities about seven weeks ago, destroying and disrupting so much of their normal way of life that we're still tallying up the costs, physical, financial, and emotional. The storm left behind any number of healthcare problems as well. Hospitals and clinics shut down, homeowners and tenants without light and heat for days or weeks, thousands dealing with water and mold. And intertwined with all of this, the mental health impact of loss, of dislocation, and simply having to cope with it all. Joining me are three people who can talk about these challenges and how they're being met. Dr. Michael Lucchese, Chief Medical Officer of Downstate Medical Center. Dr. Delrita Ambacrombie is a clinical psychologist at Brookdale University Hospital and Medical Center. And representing FEMA, Robert Hamaker, a crisis counseling program specialist. Thank you all for being here. I just have to say um, that I am an employee of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, but today I am here exclusively as the host of the program and as a physician not representing the city. So thank you. I know a lot has been going on. So let's start with you, Michael. What have you been seeing? We're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of respiratory illnesses, um, and that's from a various, uh, various reasons. That's from mold, and that's from all the dust and the fragments that are coming up. We're, we're seeing um, a lot of people who are cold, a lot of people who are hungry, a lot of people who are scared. So we're seeing a, a lot of depression. But do they walk in and say, I'm depressed? No, they don't. They, uh, just, like, just like it's very interesting, just like um, domestic violence, uh, sometimes they'll come into the hospital, they'll come to the emergency department with totally unrelated complaints, headaches, abdominal pain, um, loss of appetite, and they don't want to say it, and they might not even know that they are depressed. Um, is Downstate seeing additional people as a result of... Um... Without a doubt. Our, our emergency departments have been very, very busy. Actually, all over the city, the emergency departments have been very busy. We still have four hospitals uh, that are not functioning. There are multiple clinics. There are a lot of private physicians as well that, um, that have lost uh, their offices, and so they're, uh, they're not seeing their patients. I'm glad that we're here with you, Robert. May I call you Robert sure. from FEMA? Um, what exactly are you doing in this area? What's FEMA doing in this area? Well, FEMA's been funding crisis counseling programs since 1974. And um, fortunately or unfortunately, in, in New York area, we've, we've, uh, you have experienced crisis counselors from 9-11 and from, from Lee and, and um, Irene, now this. Uh, so, so the, we do the the, pro, the crisis counseling program is is, is short term uh, efforts at trying to help people express their their normal emotional reactions to this very abnormal event. To loss. To loss. To loss. A, a, uh, largely a lot of lost, loss. Largely loss. It's it, it, uh, and and so we've been training about 700 counselors. We just finished seven about about 700 as of yesterday. And these then counselors are, are free to start going out and, and assisting people. Well, what, what have you been seeing? Because this is citywide. So even though certain communities were impacted, it has affected all of us. So in Brookdale, uh, have you been seeing any impact from um, Sandy in terms of the people you're seeing? Yes, we've had an influx of, of, of people in the community who have need help with their housing, with concrete services, problem solving and just respite. So we've been a supportive hospital in that we did have some areas that we were renovating, so we took those patients in and we let them have um, beds, you know, places to stay, food, also the workers. You mean essentially acting as a shelter for, for some of them yeah. in, in, in the hospital? As well as the workers from the hospital. So many travel from the downstate um, medical center, other doctors from New Jersey, come over sometimes also as well to, to stay in the hospital. So we've made accommodations for most of the people who are working there and the, uh, the neighboring community. I'm glad you mentioned the workers because a lot of times we're focused on people in the community and forget that some of the people in the community are those who 
need to provide services. So during the um, immediate aftermath of the storm, did you have people that were not able to go home or their homes themselves were impacted? Yes, we did. And in fact, we, we made accommodations for the employees to stay at the hospital as well. And their families also were invited to, to stay at the hospital and we you know, accommodated them as well. And what about downstate? Without a doubt. Um, you know, this is, just like we saw with 9-11, with, with the uh, World Trade Centers, there were, there were people who were heroes that you'll never hear about. There are people that came to work. There are those who were in proximity. There are those who came in when it wasn't their time to work. Um, I think it's very important for us all to realize is that this is a marathon, it's not a sprint, that the aftermath of this storm is going to be with us for several months. So that's very important for people to understand. It's just not, it's not almost over. It's, there's still cleanup. There's still people getting their lives back together. You know, the thing that is impressed me is I went to one of the communities that was impacted and sort of two blocks out of the community, you don't know that anything has happened. And um, I don't know whether or not you've selected certain communities. How are people knowing know where to go for services? Who's managing this? So, so, so the, there's about 35 providers that are being contracted with in the nine counties. And, and one of the first things these, these 700 counselors are doing is, is outreaching into the communities. And they have maps that, that show the areas where the, the uh, most impact has happened. That's where they're going to go first. But they're literally going door to door in pairs with Project Hope jackets on, uh, saying, how, you know, trying to help people deal with these emotional reactions. And, and they, too, have often been uh, survivors of this event with their own homes damaged, destroyed, etc. So, so. I, I'm, I'm uh, glad you mentioned going door to door um, because there are lots of people going door to door. Do you know what the reception has been? Because there are people going door to door to see if you have electricity or water or plaster falling and so forth. So lots of people are doing lots of things door to door. Were people fairly receptive to the help? Well, s many of these counselors have been going out door to door already because they're part of the community and we deliberately hire from the community so that they're, you know, they can be trusted. But there are, our Project Hope people are going to have a vest on that says Project Hope. They're going to be in pairs. Um, and, and certainly some people are welcoming, some people are, are, are uh, su suspicious, but, but they'll go back more than once. <laughs> and, and their name, the re recognition will increase over time. So trust and reception will, will increase. It, uh, it's a progressive thing, and so, as you said, it's a, it's a, mar it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. So they're gonna, they'll be there in the communities for probably a year at least. You know, one of the things that happened when I was talking to people immediately after the storm was a shock value, that people were shocked that it had this much impact in New York. We never thought of ourselves as being vulnerable. Have you come across that with people sort of being taken aback by this, and how has that impacted uh, what your work is. I think, I think the, the, the big issue was that just last year we had Irene, and Irene didn't turn out to be nearly as uh, devastating as, as we, we were concerned about. So um, a lot of people didn't, didn't really, well, even though, even though I think there was plenty of information out there that this was totally different than Irene, a lot of people were just very uncomfortable about leaving their homes, about evacuating, about you know, the impact that this storm could have, and it really had a, a huge impact. So the shock factor is there, without a doubt. Have you had people coming in talking about, I can't believe this happened? Oh, yes. If people have come in, a woman was telling me a story of how she has this lovely, beautiful home right on the water, and, and, uh, and her, you know, she, her family is in the construction business, you know. She knows a lot of it. You know, her home is beautiful. And... And she said she, so she was prepared. She had the, uh, she had taken everything up to the second floor where the bedrooms are, just in case. She had all of her candles, her flashlights, her food, her blanket, everything, you know, for the family. And so she thought she was comfortable. So she didn't really think about leaving, evacuating, you know. So her house, as she was looking, the water was coming up the stairs and then it went up into, into the, um, the first, her living room, the basement was flooded, then it went up to the bedroom level, and she was thinking, well, the next thing was either to die or to go on the roof of the house. But fortunately, it took long enough for the water, 
that the tide went down. So eventually the tide went down so that she could get her family out of the house and the rescue people came there and took them to, you know, higher ground. And she, you know, they had, they just got back their electricity and their uh, heating. You know, it's been like over a month. It's interesting that you brought how long it took them to get it because I encountered people who had had their electricity knocked out by Sandy. Two weeks later, they got it back and then the Nor'easter came and knocked it out again. <clears throat> and they had been doing fine emotionally until the second hit. So who's administering these crisis programs that we're gonna need to have for around for a long time? Who was who doing it through FEMA? I mean, you know, I know FEMA is responsible, but who's uh, well, the, administering the, it? The state contracts with, with FEMA, and, and the state is contracting with the, the nine counties and 35 providers, 35 providers that are already existing providers in the community that have been experienced with Irene and 9-11. And, and so they're, they're, they're very well versed in, in, in this, unfortunately. <laughs> I just want to go back for one minute Robert, because everybody says initials, and many people don't know what anything stands for. Would you tell people what FEMA means? Oh, <laughs> Federal Emergency Management Agency, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've used the initials so long, I'm not even positive either. <laughs> but I'm FEMA, but what does it mean? Federal um, Emergency, Emergency Management, Management Agency. Agency. Yeah. Um, the thing is, is that I know that you're talking about crisis, emotional crisis, and so forth, but FEMA covers in general many other aspects. It, it, is a, it, it does a lot of things, and I've been with FEMA for the last four years, and I wouldn't presume to know all of what FEMA does, uh, but, but uh, certainly the entree for, for most citizens is to, to register with FEMA, and, uh, and, and that's, the deadline for registering is January 28th, uh, 19th. 2013. 2013, right, right. So that's an important point that we need to be sure we make is that people can still register. They still have almost a month that they can register with FEMA. Right, and, and so FEMA then provides some housing assistance and some property loss assistance. It's, it's, it's limited assistance. It doesn't make you whole, but it's, try, it's to help you get started again. Uh, people are often disappointed that it's not as good as real insurance, but it's, it's a limited program, but it does help people get started. Um, the crisis counseling program has no registration limits. It's available, uh, it, it, as I say, the program will probably evolve over the year. People can enter at any time. Well, that's a good uh, thing because there are some people who are mobilized, right? Uh, yes, they have post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a disorder that per a person might have for six months or up to two years. It might, you know, continue longer depending upon their circumstances. You know, but they feel very detached, depressed, anxious. You know, they might have nightmares, sleep problems. So they're going to need long-term, you know, at least supportive care. And some people are in denial, too, that it really did happen, and that they have to go through this process. But if you have, you know, counseling services in place, it is a but benefit. But sometimes during this period, they're mobilized to do things. Is that correct? Right. You know, a lot of problem solving, you know, concrete assistance in terms of just knowing they have a place. Like, for example, with the FEMA where they can go, there are people there who are familiar with their situation. They can sign up for some type of assistance. That gives them some hope. It gives them support. And then the, and a, along with the therapist to talk about their family relationships, you know, and how everyone is working together. I think the community working together, you know, has made a big difference supportively. You know, because there have been various events. There's an event today, you know, for um, the Sandy victims. Um, Jay-Z had his uh, Thanksgiving dinner for the Sandy victims at the Barclay, New Barclay Center. This is a way that people, this is Brooklyn, though. This is something that I think is unique to Brooklyn. And it, it's a benefit to the people here. It may not be totally unique, but we do it in a bigger, better way, I think, here in Brooklyn. I'm not biased or anything, no. but that's just my thinking. What were you about to say, Robert? Well, the, the crisis counseling program is, is paraprofessional counseling. It's, it's, it's aimed at the, more, the normal reactions for, that people will have to this, again, abnormal event. And, but it's also supervised by mental health professionals, very closely supervised. So if people have 
a more severe problem like the depression or PTSD that you mentioned, then they're going to make referrals to the existing service providers in the community. That, that gets beyond what the FEMA program does. Is that one of the 35 people that you've mentioned? Well, the because you mentioned 700, and those are 700 that just finished training. Are they the paraprofessionals? Yes, those are the paraprofessionals. Well, they're supervisors too, so there's mental health professionals among them. So maybe every six person is going to be a mental health professional closely supervising these paraprofessionals so that if, the, if we are identifying more severe problems and they make a competent referral to to agencies maybe those 35 maybe others that uh, that can provide the more intensive services that's not FEMA funded but uh, the more yeah. intensive services are not right well it's a good thing that we're about to have a situation beginning in I guess January 2013 that people will not will have, first of all, mental health parity. Mm -hmm. Is that what uh, we're going to have? I think mm -hmm. it's January that it starts. Right. So that people will not have to say you've had your 10 treatments and then you're finished. So people can be screened by FEMA counselors, correct? Sure. Referred for additional services. And hopefully we'll have it in place so that people can get the mental health they need without um, even if they don't have private insurance, to get the continued help they need. Right, that's a part of the intimacy law. That's right. We have it in New York State already, right. is that correct? Right. Uh, and one other clarification, you keep mentioning nine counties, and I'm glad it's nine counties, but people need to know that the nine counties, five boroughs are part of those nine counties. Yes, I. my vocabulary is... Not correct. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. Just to know that the five boroughs of New York City are part of the nine counties that they can access these services. Yeah. So I have to ask you a question that may be a left curve for you um, out of left field. But I had a case of a man who had seven life-saving medicines that he needed when he was in an evacuation shelter. And I worked on helping him get them for a long time finally found a pharmacist who would do X, Y, and Z to get it. And just as I hung up the phone and told him, he apologized. He said, there was somebody who was going to feed my cat, a young person who could walk up all the steps because there's no electricity in my building. And they just called me and said they can't do it. And I'm sorry you've gone through all this trouble, but I have to go home anyway to feed my cat and to make sure my cat's okay. So have any of you had these instances where it seemed almost irrational, but pets are? Pets are part of their lives, without a doubt. Yeah. It's a very stabilizing force in their life, so people have lost their pets. There are pets out there that, that, that are, are lost from their homes. There are people that can no longer care for their pets. This all adds into it. Pets are very, are very good and very stabilizing, especially people who had it for a long time. They've had those animals. Yeah. So what are the, some of the other issues? Has food insecurity been an issue with any of the people that you've seen? Or Well, you all were providing, but what are some of the other issues that you've seen? Um, in terms of clothing, in terms of education, many children were not able to go to school for about a month. You know, and some of the schools had to be closed. They had to take buses to new schools. That's a big adjustment. Not only t are they disrupted from their home, their community, now they have to go to a school in another borough and meet new teachers, a whole new situation, and it's very traumatic for them. So people are, are taking, you know, the children to the libraries, taking them to the museums. You know, to, we try to encourage them to use the city as a support system in that respect. You know, and, and the kids are beginning to understand, you know, the importance of education and reading biographies about people who've survived from the past. It's interesting to talk to them. In the hospital, we have a school. So the children who are in the hospital, you know, do attend school f f through the Board of Education. So some of them were in the hospital during the storm. And so they, and, and of course, they all want to go home. And, you know, so they're looking out the window and they don't really know what's happening out there. We try to, you know, let them know that their parents will be coming to see them, you know, if they can or if they do, they can stay. And we have the teachers, they read them stories and, you know, we try to make them feel comfortable. In the evacuation center where I work, they had a Halloween party for all of the kids, which really was very helpful and people donated books. Now we're talking about coping skills for the children and we talked about therapy, but what are some of the coping skills that 
um, adults, because you know not everybody will accept therapy even though they need it. What are some of the coping skills that they may be able to use that may not um, immediately have to do with therapy uh, if they're unwilling to to engage in therapy. I think, I think in this, you know, uh, uh, helping, uh, being part of uh, of is very therapeutic when you can help someone who doesn't have um, the same resources that you do, and no matter how badly you're doing, someone who's doing worse, um, and 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 that's very th therapeutic. That's uh, th that's that's fantastic. So, so volunteering and helping volunteering is, is very is, is absolutely is, wonderful. Is therapeutic. Yes. People feel that they're not alone, you know, so that they, you know, even though they're getting, they don't see it as being therapy, being therapy, you know, it's just being a part of the community and like, as you say, helping other people, humanitarian types of values that make them feel good about themselves. And sometimes helping someone else will give you insight where you can think of something to help yourself as well. So, you know, sharing of ideas and problem solving and respect. You know, you have to have a lot of respect for people who are going through a difficult time. And so it, it is like a humbling experience and it's also, you know, um, you grow from it and people feel good about it. I don't know how much you all have been working with other institutions. You mentioned library and so forth. But during this time of crisis is a time when many institutions come together to uh, work on a crisis. So. Um, we have the mental health and we have the health care and we have housing, some going on. <clears throat> have you all been involved with any other, um, you mentioned Board of Ed, faith community, anything uh, with the faith communities that you know about that they're uh, able to, um, I've met a few faith people who've been involved. Mm -hmm. So the referrals are very important and uh, before I get to that, I want to know whether or not you all want to state what people can do to get in touch with you, because of course that will be an issue. So Brookdale Hospital. Brookdale Hospital's number is 718-240-5000. And 240-5000. Right. And they can call and ask what's going on with FEMA. Right. I, no, sorry, FEMA is Robert, to ask what's going on to help people who were in Sandy or right. what facilities you have. Dr. Lucchese? Well, yeah, you know, at, at Long Island College Hospital and, and, um, and SUNY Downstate, you know, we're, we're pretty much out there. We're involved with the community. I would recommend that people keep in contact with their health care providers because like we touched on a little bit before, um, just filling up prescriptions. Uh, people, especially respiratory illnesses, people with asthma or chronic bronchitis or emphysema, Make sure now as we're getting into the winter time that you're vaccinated uh, for, for the flu and that you have fresh supplies of all your medications and you're taking your medications diligently. Keep in contact with your doctors and obviously emergency departments are the, are the, the, the last uh, resort for people who need it, but we're, we're open 24-7. I'm glad you mentioned respiratory issues, which we, you've already covered, flu, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But can you give me a brief us a brief uh, description about mold because that's yeah. very important and we didn't talk about it right. and it's very common after a flood. It's very common. It's underneath the, the, the carpets. It's everything where there's any kind of moisture or especially moisture and some sort of darkness and people it's very allergic so people who have those baseline respiratory issues really need to be careful about it. Those who don't and there it's a whole it's a whole continuum so you might have asthma but then there are people that are almost asthmatic who are now going to have wheezing and respiratory issues. So they have to make sure that everything is dry, everything is cleaned, all that, that damaged material is out. And just pulling that damaged material up sends gonna, all this into the air. So it makes things worse. One other point is some people say, I don't have asthma. They'll be having all the symptoms. Right. So could you address that? They have hyperactive bit? airway, believe it or not. There are people who only when they get sick. They wheeze, and they remember all that through their lives when they were children, they wheezed. So they haven't been given the, the definition of asthma, but they have what they call hyperactive airway. And mole in the air like that really precipitates that, brings that out. And if you don't have your medication, get to some place and get mm -hmm. it immediately. Right, get your medication. Now, one other issue that people need to know, because you need your inhaler as soon as you start that, you right. need your inhaler if you don't have it. Many pharmacists have ways of calling your previous pharmacy yes. and getting the prescription and, and, and providing it for yes, you. Yes, they can. And the pharmacies are being very, very cooperative as well. They are. Yes. yes. So 
Now we'll go to the phone numbers. <laughs> if you have it, if you don't, we're going to put it up later. But to get in touch with the counseling um, so center. Pro yeah, so Project Hope is, is contracted with LifeNet, which is an existing crisis line in the city, but it's, it's, it's going to be relevant to all nine counties now. And that's 1-800-LIFENET. 1-800-LIFENET. That's right. pretty easy. That's pretty easy. Yeah. But they can make referrals to the, the whole crisis counseling program. Mm -hmm. so. And everyone knows pretty much where Downstate and Long Island College Hospital are. Yes. And how to get to those emergency rooms for assistance. If they needed, yes. I thank you all for being here and giving us this valuable information for this marathon that we're in and uh, all the resources that you're providing to the community. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. That's all for this month. To watch this discussion again and to see all of our past healthcare stories, go to brickartsmedia.org slash BIT and then click on HealthBeat Brooklyn. And you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter on BK Independent TV. I'm Dr. Monica Sweeney. Thanks for watching and stay healthy.